Recently-ish, I saw Blade Driver, directed by Denis Villeneuve, the latest sequel to Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. I didn't see the 2047 other Blade Runners, but if this is the level of quality between all of them, hot damn. By the way, this is not based on Blade Runner 2 by KW Jeter. Thank your lucky stars were in this world line, holy. 2049 is the fifth Villeneuve film I've seen, after Prisoners, which could have been great if the plot hadn't been ridiculous, Enemy, a movie with a rather split reception from me, as well as some of the most in-your-face symbolism I've seen outside of anime, Arrival, which I quite liked, except where it fucked up its most pivotal plot point, and 10 feet taller Andale Andale, which was, mm, mm, that was a good one, dripping with misogyny. Speaking of... Nice. Villeneuve has a decent track record, so I was more afraid 2049 would fuck that up for him more than he would fuck up Blade Runner. It is, after all, an unnecessary and therefore forced sequel. Those have a notorious reputation for being notoriously bad. So I'm relieved to say, I liked it. But ain't nobody paying me to like nothing. No, I really did like parts of 2049, but it wasn't enough to convince me that this unnecessary sequel was warranted. We'll get into it. First, let me say some nice things. It's goddamn gorgeous! I've never wanted to live so badly in another horrific dystopian nightmare world than this. Minus the worm food. Mmm, mm, worm doodle. Squishy, squashy worm doodle. But for real, 2049 oozes aesthetic. All I'd have to do is pause the movie at nearly any point, and I could use that frame for my cyberpunk ASMR sleeping aids. Point is that the movie nails the look and feel of its world. Just nails it. Gonna have to sneak a great big helping of criticism in here, though. It doesn't look like Blade Runner. It's damn well lit for a sequel to the neo-noir thriller shrouded in darkness. Where lighting popped and glowed due to the contrast in OG Blade Runner, here it's spread far more evenly. It all looks a lot cleaner. Not a whole lot of that swirling smokiness or excessive steam. Even a sand-choked wasteland looks sanitized. Nor is there the clutter that filled Blade Runner's backgrounds. The 80s vintage aesthetic is mostly missing, but that's going to happen when the sequel is released more than 30 years afterward. Everything's a lot more open, still gloomy, just less claustrophobic, far fewer close-ups on faces, and so on. It looks great, but if it weren't for the use of Blade Runner's famous iconography, visually I'd think I were watching a cyberpunk oblivion. Most everybody brought their A-game. Ryan Gosling reprised his role of scary weirdo with Asperger's, and it was excellent. Jared Leto's Joker was more restrained this time. Even Harrison Ford was properly cast as grumpy old curmudgeon. Finally. The music was alright, pretty ambient and atmospheric, not really a soundtrack I'd listen to outside of the film, but it worked well within it. The tracks were apparently composed by Hans Zimmer and Benjamin Walfish, but I don't know, parts of it sounded a lot like the work of Johan Johansson, the composer on many of Villeneuve's films. I looked into it and yeah, he was originally going to be 2049's composer. Then that later changed, and now he's contractually restricted from talking about it. Hmm. If you go into 2049 expecting a Van esque soundtrack, prepare to be sorely disappointed. Some seem to hear the similarities. Frankly, I do not. The writing wasn't that great, actually. Strange, considering they brought back the writer from the original Blade Runner, Hampton Fancher. Wait, Michael Green. Don't recognize that gem. Let's see. Oh, wow. Okay. That probably explains a few lines. Hey, you've been getting on fine without one. What's that, man? A soul. I had the lock, and he has the key. No! No! I love the character of Kay, and I love his arc. I loved his interactions with Joy and her function in his story. These two pretty much made the movie for me. The rest? <sighs> Like the first Blade Runner, the world feels remarkably grounded, even with giant digital faces smiling creepily at its denizens. Or maybe because of them. I can go on at length about how I think both movies expertly craft this grounded feeling, but honestly, it's probably because we all subconsciously understand that when the displaced savaged hordes overrun everything, East Asians will be the only ones racist enough to come out on top and keep the lower classes on life support to manage their sweatshops while everyone else flees off world. In spite of that, however, you wouldn't really assume many Asian people lived in this 2049, because not one gets a speaking role, nor do any minorities really. There was a black guy who ran a child sweatshop, I guess, but otherwise, is just white, 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 Cuban, white, 
half white, white, and white. Incredibly unrealistic. Whites are already massively a minority in the world, and they're supposed to be a minority in the US by 2040. This is nine years after that, yet nearly everybody's white. Typical Hollywood whitewashing. Why aren't we seeing more of a backlash to this? Fucking disgusting, TBH. Despite what I'm about to say, and a lot of it is pretty mean, I honestly, honestly did enjoy Blade Runner 2049. And if you saw it and thought it was a masterpiece, good for you. Now let's get into why you're fucking wrong. My first gripe is actually equal parts praise and whining. The first scene of 2049 is lifted from a scrapped opening to the original Blade Runner, where Deckard was to sit in the dark of a farmer's kitchen and a farmer was to come in, put on some soup, and ask who Deckard was. Deckard would introduce himself as a Blade Runner, then immediately kill the farmer, exposing it as a replicant. And so we have our protagonist, Kay, sitting in a darkened kitchen waiting for a worm farmer to come in and stir his... Worm goop. Only, this scene is slightly, enormously altered from its humble conception. K is unambiguously a replicant, so they had to get that across quickly through dialogue. In fact, K and the farmer get pretty damn chatty, setting up a ton of important plot points before getting into a wall-busting brawl, instead of a one-sided murder. Because 2049 had way too much information to convey, it couldn't just let K pull a Han Solo. It had to set up the pregnant replicant, so we had to have a big old conversation and the miracle line. I have to praise this opening because it's still super efficient and lays the groundwork for 2049's story well. But tonally it's a different scene from what it's paying homage to. Instead of a detached prologue meant to introduce the protagonist with a literal bang, it's very much attached to the overarching narrative and prioritizes plot over everything else. It's good, don't get me wrong, but I can't lie and say I wasn't disappointed to recognize the setup only for Kay to not shoot the farmer. Eh, missed opportunities. Back to the replicating replicant. 2049 revolves around this idea that a replicant, specifically Rachel, Deckard's love interest from Blade Runner, got pregnant and created new life. I both like this idea and very much don't. What I like about it is that it follows naturally from Blade Runner. Rachel was a Nexus 7 model, an experimental type of replicant built to pass off as human. It stands to reason that a Nexus 7 would eventually need the biological functions of a human to properly mimic being a human. So sure, self-replicating replicants was the next logical step. What I don't like about this is that the baby maker replicant is Rachel. 2049 goes a step further and explicitly suggests that Rachel was precisely for the purpose of being impregnated, and by Rick Deckard no less, because he was the protagonist. This means that everything that occurred between Deckard and Rachel might not have occurred naturally, but instead artificially, whether Deckard himself is a replicant or not. Not only does this pull the rug out from under the original Blade Runner and softly reassign the meaning of nearly everything in it, it doesn't even make sense. See, Eldon Tyrell wanted to assuage the rising emotional instability in the Nexus 6 models. Their four-year lifespans were too short to come to terms with their burgeoning emotions, so Rachel was built and implanted with the memories of Tyrell's niece to make her believe she was human, which would act as a framework to cushion her own emotions. That was what Rachel was for. She was an experiment to resolve the Nexus 6 problem. But 2049 would have you believe that Tyrell went drastically further than that. He was lying to Decker the whole time about simply gifting replicants the past. He went whole hog and created a successfully fertile replicant before he ever confirmed that Rachel would consider herself human, then paraded her around a Blade Runner so that he'd fuck her and create a brand new form of life. That's pretty fucking twisted, even for Tyrell. First of all, he based Rachel off of his niece. 2049 is telling you that Tyrell replicated his niece so that she could be impregnated by another man. He was a weirdo, that Tyrell, but don't think he was supposed to be into pseudo-incestual cuckoldry. Second of all, if Rachel had the four-year limitation, she couldn't be a mother to her own child. 2049 definitely dodges this, maybe she does, maybe she doesn't, by killing her in childbirth. Kinda smart, but also kinda deceptive, you sly, sly dogs. <laughs> even if Tyrell fervently wanted to see his niece knocked up, and even if Rachel had an open-ended lifespan, it's all still a little fucking rushed, don't you think? Hmm, can a replicant not know it's a replicant? Let's find out. Wait. Can a replicant replicate? I should probably put that aside until I get the simulated humanity thing down, but now nah, let's do both right fucking now. Could this have been how it happened? Yeah, sure. Is it better that this is how it happened? 
Hell no. The simple solution to this giant mistake would be to make the pregnant replicant anyone but Rachel. Some other madman had to want to build the perfect waifu that wasn't his own family member, right? That's totally believable. This doesn't have to be Rachel in any capacity. Oh wait, yes, yes it does, because you gotta have that needless tie-in to the OG movie while Harrison's still alive. No one's gonna want to watch a Blade Runner 2 without Harrison Ford in it. Oh, wait. The Rachel thing was the first genuine misfire for me from 2049, but whatever. It wasn't that big a deal. I let it slide and got invested in the movie. I liked Kay and his new not quite a name. I liked how he moved on from being a driver and threw himself into his new Blade Runner occupation. I liked how he was still a robotic shell of a person, though it looks like his past relationship with Irene hit him hard. Realizing he'd nearly cocked himself with the used goods of some ex-convict, he swore off real girls and got a holographic girlfriend instead. Luckily, Joy is the cutest. I love Joy. Not the best Holo GF and not even the best Felicity Jones GF, but I'll take three, please. I love you. You don't have to say that. I know. Aww. Joy is warm yes! and sensitive, yes! funny, sexy, yes! someone easy to talk to. Yes! She really shows love. Yes! I have one minuscule nitpick about Joy. While hollow GFs are assuredly the future, they won't look like this. They'll be banned outright in the US, not for any decent reason but because of outcry from women's groups, and we'll have to import them from Japan where they're going to look a little more like this. <laughs> But hey, a small quibble. A much bigger quibble is the fact that 2049's villain, well, he sucks. This is Neander Wallace. I think he's blind by choice. Anyway, he's essentially an evil Tyrell, with none of the subtlety of his predecessor. Real talk, the first thing we see this guy do is birth one of his new replicant models, then stab the shit out of it. Why? Because he's evil. I wish I were kidding. The best excuse that I could find online for Wallace's spontaneity was that he was intimidating his henchwoman replicant, Love, to ensure her obedience. Pretty sure the thought that he'd need to show his own replicant whose boss never crossed his mind. Me thinks he's just another Marvel tier villain. No, he's not, ER. He has a god complex. He giveth life and he taketh it away. The stabbing makes sense for the type of person he is. Hey, look, I love characters with god complexes. If I had a list my top 10 favorite fictional characters of all time. About three or four of them think they're God or some devil. I love that edgy shit. But here's the thing, they're all very deliberate in their actions. They don't just kill people because they can. But it's not a person ER, it's a replicant. A barren one at that, which obviously upset Wallace, provoking him to stab it. Again, it makes sense for the type of person he is. It got out of control. Got out of control. I hate when things get out of control. <laughs> So Wallace has this new model come to life, watches, or listens rather, to it quiver in fear for who knows how long, and after it's nice and toweled off, he monologues about how he makes angels at his supposedly soulless replicant henchwoman? Uh, why? Well, I guess he was just in the mood for that. Then he kills the newborn and says something about how they're going to colonize the stars and storm Eden. Just to squeeze one more biblical reference in there, just in case you didn't catch that Wallace has a god complex. Having your egotistic villain introduce himself by ranting about angels, name dropping Eden, and murdering a newborn is such a boring collection of mental shortcuts to bad guy, it hurt to watch. It's almost as bad as making your villain a boil ridden lard ass who's somehow actually extremely competent, yet keeps his women in a vault because he can't make them like him, but he also lets them read awfully rare books and play piano because... Uh. It's even worse because Walsh's character is the follow-up to Eldon Tyrell, whom likewise had a god complex, only he didn't stab his creations willy-nilly like some psychopathic man-baby. He called the replicants his children, he didn't call them angels, and he didn't call the Nexus 6 rogues bad or fallen angels. Instead, Blade Runner lets us, the audience, make that connection for ourselves. Oh, and Wallace likens the use of replicants to human slavery, just in case you, you know, Miss that blindingly, blindingly obvious, obvious parallel. Is it possible that a man in Wallace's position could have a disposition like Wallace with a penchant for stabbing robots for the hell of it? Sure, it's just boring and cheap. I have a few suggestions. Nix the angel talk. Less monologuing about colonizing the stars. Have Wallace gut the replicant, but have him do it surgically, like a vivisection, keeping the replicant alive during. Have him question himself. What am I missing that Tyrell had, love? You can establish an inferiority complex regarding Tyrell while 
demonstrating Wallace's callous ambition. And then slowly, agonizingly, the replicant can die. Wallace can shed a tear for it, or simply not give a shit. And then he'll tell Love to find the child. But this is all just off the top of my head. Either way, 2049's saving grace is that Wallace has precious little screen time, and his henchwoman essentially acts as the main antagonist in his stead, so you're not too often reminded of how goofy he is. He has all-seeing eyebots because he's God! Get it? The movie is at its best when Kay is detectiving. Joy supports him and gives advice without being naggy, and it's genuinely interesting and enjoyable to watch. I will say though that the expectation of a twist soured my movie watching experience. Setting up the mysterious identity of the replicant child meant that the first replicant I saw, Kay, had to be candidate number one and that'd be super lame. 2049 actually tricked me into thinking it'd be that amateurish. Then it pulled the old double twist on me. Well done, Blade Runner. You played me by making me think you were going to be a worse movie. Unfortunately, 2049 purposefully misdirects the viewer to hide its twist by cheating. Okay, so it can be assumed that Kay's replicant model, presumably a Wallace model, is a cross between Tyrell's Nexus 6 and 7 models. Unlike the Nexus 7, this model has constructed memories, not borrowed human ones, to fill the gaps where it lacks a past. Kay knows his memories are fake and that he is not human, and must routinely take a test to measure his emotional state, which seems kinda counterintuitive. Rachel had a bit of a breakdown from realizing she wasn't as human as her memories suggested. Why doesn't Kay? Why don't the others? Well, the movie ain't about that so it doesn't even nominally address it. Yippee! So Kay needs to know if his memory of being the replicant miracle child is real or fake. To answer this, he goes to see a memory maker named Anna Staline. Real or fake, however, is the incorrect paradigm. In just the scene previously, Kay already confirmed that what had happened in his memory had indeed happened. So the memory itself had to be real. The real question should have been whether the memory was actually his or an implant. But anyway, Kay asks Anna for help with the case, then about her memory making work. And we get to the point that Anna coyly says that implanting real memories is illegal. Kay has Anna confirm that his memory was somebody's real memory, which he already did. He doesn't seem to care whether or not it's implanted, that it's genuine is enough for him. Which left me really confused for a few minutes. I got around to thinking illegal must mean impossible, and concluded that Kay had to be the replicant child. That was disappointing and not even really believable, but it was the only way that scene made sense. If you don't exactly agree with my reasoning, also note that Anna viewed her memory and neglected to tell Kay it was hers. Why would she do that? Because what she did was illegal and Kay is with the LAPD? Was she afraid of getting caught in a crime? Then why would she confirm that the memory was a real memory in the first place, putting memory makers like herself under suspicion? She shouldn't know she's the replicant child or a replicant at all. Not to mention Kay brought none of that up anyway, so it's not like she was hiding that either. Guess she didn't want to spoil Kay's good mood. <laughs> Assuming that she assumed that Kay incorrectly believed the memory was his and that he wouldn't ask any more questions about it or anything related to his other memories. Woo! This twist relies on Kay asking the wrong question and Anna answering it deceptively. It also relies on Kay being dumb enough to not confirm whether his other memories are real or manufactured, which would be the real litmus test for him being the replicant child, not this horse shit. Ah. Ultimately, this twist is predicated on character stupidity misdirecting us. That's pretty pretty poor. Not among the worst examples I've seen, but damn. I'm unsure how to fix it. If Kay is able to check his memories, which he must be able to do if they can be manufactured, then the only thing preventing him from blowing the lid off the twist is himself, right? He has to play dumb for a later shock value. Don't you love it when a character's existential crisis is utterly dependent on it being a huge misunderstanding that could have been easily avoided? Me too! Ah uh, well. Alright, so I've avoided it long enough, I gotta address Deckard. By the way, is everyone else really enjoying watching Harrison Ford replay all of his most iconic characters, but this time as grumpy old men? Whenever I see a relatively young action-oriented hero on the silver screen, I uh, I end up just psyched as hell to see them aged up to when their fastest run is a fucking waddle. I can't wait for the born retirement and die hard from leukemia. Sorry, sorry, back to Deckard. We all know, deep down in our black little hearts, that they made this movie because Harrison Ford agreed to star in it. But was his presence strictly required and did it improve the story being told? No, on both counts. 
Oh, the RQ. Many are very, very passionate about this. I'm going to be upfront and say, on this question, I'm a radical centrist. That is to say, I don't think there is a definitive answer to the RQ. Therefore, Deckard is a maybe human, maybe replicant. In Philip K. Dick's novel... Oh, that's where the K came from. Cool, I didn't think about that until just now. Hmm. Nifty. In PKD's novel, although the possibility is brought into question, Deckard is not an android. Blade Runner is almost nothing like the book, however, so referring back to it is not especially pertinent. The term Blade Runner itself isn't connected to it and was optioned from a different book where it made actual sense instead of none. Ridley Scott has confidently admitted to not bothering to read all of the book anyway. I believe him. The short answer for why I think Blade Runner opts for ambiguity is because it's the screenwriter's position on the matter. And that's the beauty of something that's good, I guess, you know, you can, it's ambiguous. And my interpretation had nothing to do with, oh, that shows that Deckard's a, a replica. I don't think anything should, should show that Deckard's a replica. If you think that, you're already wrong, you know? I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a question mark is what's interesting. The answer is stupid. It's not gonna come he up. is definitely a replicant. What I thought was thought. You like that? Scott prefers the stupid answer. Unlike some filmmakers who make up shit after the fact and pretend it was all according to plan, I really believe Scott intended for there to be some ambiguity on the RQ from the beginning. But like some directors who don't know when to leave well enough alone, he changed his mind. From a purely story standpoint, Deckard looks far more human than he does Replicant in every cut of the film. Blade Runner, I concede to the human purists, does a horrible job of balancing the two possibilities. Turn myself into a Replicant. Morty! I'm Replicant. Rick! I wouldn't have done it, but someone told me not to. So how does 2049 treat the RQ? I keep reading that it's handled cleverly because it avoids it, and it does, to the detriment of the plot. By dragging Deckard back for this role in this kind of plot, if you're not thinking about all of the ramifications it has on the RQ, then you're just not thinking. Whether or not Deckard is a replicant is extremely significant to 2049's plot. He's the father of THE replicant child, which makes this next question terribly important. Is the child born of two replicants, or a replicant human pairing? When face to face with Deckard, K, in search for answers, does not dare to clear up Deckard's shifty existence, because that would ruin the Blade Runner lore. Wallace is better. When face to face with Deckard, he brings up the possibility that Deckard was designed, although in the dumbest possible way. He kind of suggests that Deckard might have been constructed for the sole purpose of procreating with Rachel in the missionary position. No. Just no, no. If that was even remotely the case, what an unbelievably convoluted way to go about it. Tyrell made a replicant, let or had the LAPD hire him to hunt down other replicants because replicants on Earth is illegal, then let that illegal replicant retire, then brought him back into the fold to fuck his other illegal replicant? What? And don't you love it when an unnecessary sequel says, oh, the purpose of this character was possibly this thing that was never hinted at or suggested in the original, so your reading of it at the time might have been all wrong. But maybe not. Deckard kind of just sits there and lets Wallace go on and on about this too. Then Wallace brings out a replicant of Rachel, I guess to see if Deckard really has a compulsory gotta fuck Rachel response, or if it'll at least get him to talk. All Deckard does is point out that the real Rachel had green eyes. You mean to tell me Wallace's people recreated a person replicant thing down to the teeniest tiniest little detail, yet they got the eye color wrong. Really? Am I not supposed to laugh at that? I did end up stifling a chuckle when Love shoots Rachel's brains out immediately afterward. Well, we fucked up! <laughs> Although, if Deckard is human and not some special replicating replicant, that brings into question why Wallace would need him to begin with. Is his sperm the chosen sperm? Does Wallace just want answers that Deckard likely cannot give? There's also the lifespan limitation dilemma. I'm of the opinion that Deckard, if a replicant, should not have had an open-ended lifespan, even if he was an experimental Nexus 7 model rather than a Nexus 6. I full stop disagree with those saying Deckard was a Nexus 8, and that's disregarding how poorly they fit into the new fanfiction timeline. Deckard being a crusty old fucker gives the human purists a lot of ammo. But there are some breadcrumbs for the replicans, like Deckard hiding out in an irradiated, inhospitable Las Vegas, like a human generally wouldn't do, and generally wouldn't survive 30 years doing. And uh, what else? Uh, 
That might have been the only breadcrumb, actually. Notwithstanding, Deckard being the progenitor of a new race of pure or hybrid replicants is well outside the scope of his character from Blade Runner. I'm sorry, it's just stupendously stupid. The amount of dumb, unneeded questions it raises hurts the impact of both Blade Runner and 2049's stories. The easy solution to this would be to make the replicant child's parents both replicants and have them be anyone but Deckard and Rachel. The best way to address the RQ would have been not at all, by leaving Ford out of this. But yes, I understand that that would have never been allowed to happen. Ford could have died before filming and they'd still CG horn him into this shit. Hollywood has never been especially interested in consent, after all. There are three big instances of the Villain Ball in 2049 that stuck out to me as particularly awful. If you're unaware, the Villain Ball is a term from TV tropes for when a villain is won, but goes out of their way to give the hero a second chance by being the typical retarded villain. The first instance is when Love and her men kidnap Deckard from Las Vegas. Love beats Kay the fuck up, but instead of killing him, which she could have easily done and had readily done to many people already, including Kay's goddamn boss, she just lets him live. Why? Because Kay needs to live until the film's conclusion. But worse, Love does something even more unnecessary. She kills Kay's hollow girlfriend by crushing Joy's projector underfoot. I should have been the one to fill your projector with light! Now this is prime villain ball. The projector was the one thing Love had left to track Kay. So not only does she let this incredibly dangerous loose end live for no good reason at all, she destroys her last means of surveillance of him so that Kay can more easily stop her later, especially if he wants to avenge his QT hollow GF. The second instance is when Deckard is taken to Wallace Corp for interrogation, but Wallace pulls a Dr. Evil and sends him off world, out of his god sight, away from all of his goons, to be more properly interrogated. Naturally, this gives Kay the opportunity to rescue Deckard during transport. And how did Kay know Wallace would send Deckard away to intercept him? Oh well, you know. Plot. The third instance is during Kay's heroic interception. Love beats the shit out of him again and once more does not kill him when given the chance. And instead just assumes he'll die and not come back to fuck her up. Kay comes back and fucks her up. Like, come on. In a worse movie, this level of incompetence would be comedic. There are lots of smaller, what were they thinking moments littered throughout 2049. Like Love waltzing right back into the police station after robbing it and killing one of their technicians before, and being able to murder the lieutenant who knew Love was the thief slash murderer. There's Kay visiting this junkyard place that is clearly, clearly the same junkyard place in a special memory shown to the audience, but he's the last person in the theater to realize it. It turns out that there's a replicant freedom movement that has been keeping eyes on Kay. And I don't remember why, if the reason was even given. It might have been, I don't, I just don't know. They patch Kay up after Las Vegas, then the leader shows up and tells him that they plan to free their people. The moment she does this though, all of the resistance members hiding behind concrete step out on cue to swelling music, so that they can make this moment more cinematic. I would comment on the rest of the scene, but my eyes rolled so far up into my head that I missed it. Nah, but this bears mentioning, the resistance leader then tells Kay to kill Deckard, so that he doesn't give away their movement's existence. She believes that Kay can magically achieve this feat with no way of knowing Deckard will be moved from Wallace Corp HQ and as a known enemy to Wallace Corp and a rogue replicant to the LAPD. Not to mention, he just got done getting wrecked by Wallace's goons, so why does she request this of him specifically? Well, because he's the main goddamn character, of course. There's a later scene where Kay encounters another Joy hologram scaled up by 1000%. Like Kay's Joy did, she talks him up as being someone special because she's a product, selling herself to a customer. Kay realizes he isn't special and had only duped himself into thinking so, which is a really cool moment and I wanted to love it. Instead of appreciating the moment, I was internally asking questions like, why would Joy be mass produced to look almost exactly the same? Are there so few hollow girl templates for this coincidence to occur? I know that everyone's digital companions are the same today, the same Siri, the same Cortana, the same Alexa, but holograms should be much more than those. These are sold for intimate companionship too, right? You'd think they'd be much more customizable and not effectively the same woman with different hairstyles, heights, and eye colors. And yet, a good scene that was a touch too on the nose and would have benefited from using another actress. Also, just wondering, are the tits customizable, or are Hollow GFs not even as good as a pirated copy of Honey Celeste? 2049's ending is just 
bad. A mortally wounded K takes Deckard to Anna's bubble, and after a line from K, Deckard goes inside to see his daughter. The movie ends before Deckard speaks a word to her, which is great. Meanwhile, outside, K has fucking died on the goddamn steps. No, it's not ambiguous. He died, and Deckard let it happen. Thanks for saving me and bringing me to my daughter, Joe. Well, uh, see ya. Oh, no, no! Golly, even Roy gave Deckard a helping hand at the end of Blade Runner. What a Deckard. Deckard seems to care about Kay though, enough to accept him by a human name, Joe, the name he frantically calls when he fears Kay might have drowned in the previous scene, but all of a sudden, Deckard either doesn't give a shit or completely misses the fact that Kay is on death's doorstep, which would make him a pretty shit detective if you ask me. The light that burns twice as bright bleeds out on the steps like a dog in the winter. Kay deserved better than this. God. Damn it. Oh, and don't forget, the bad guy, Wallace, has only been inconvenienced. Kay or Deckard have done nothing to put a stop to him. If Wallace decided to check up on the people Kay last visited and search for the replicant child, he'd eventually know to find Anna, whom can't easily be moved due to her condition. If Deckard does move her, I can't see how in the world Wallace wouldn't connect the dots, and Kay can't do a damn thing about it. When the credits began to roll, I could only imagine an after credits scene where Deckard leaves the bubble building, notices Kay's cold old corpse in the steps and just huffs grumpily. I'm too old for this shit. Everything that occurs in this movie was set in motion purely by coincidence. Kay just happened to be the one to retire the worm farmer, whom just so happened to be connected with Deckard and Rachel's child, whom just so happened to implant her memories in replicants like Kay, so he just so happened to have a personal motivation to go through with, well, the plot. And just as soon as Kay uncovers the plot, the antagonist, already aware of the MacGuffin's existence, decides then and there that he needs to participate in the plot with his plot, because you guessed it plot. It's not a terrible series of coincidences, but it remains that the plot is a series of them, and I'm never a big fan of that. I give every other movie shit for it, so 2049 gets it too. What's the deal, ER? I thought you said you liked Blade Runner 2049. Why are you making it out to be like the worst film of 2017? Believe me, I wanted to say it's a good, not great, but good movie. But it's a Blade Runner sequel, and it's a terrible Blade Runner sequel. I'd like to be able to say, while a bad Blade Runner sequel, it was still a good movie on its own terms, but the movie is literally called Blade Runner. The movie is a Blade Runner sequel, and there's no divorcing it from that fact. At least personally, I'm unable to do that. I'd be a huge hypocrite if I I did, considering my philosophy on unnecessary sequels, and it did irritate me just how much 2049 devolved into sequelitis. I'm not going to pretend that it didn't. I walked into 2049 completely expecting a pile of shit, even with my high regard of Villeneuve as a director. Despite everything, I came away pleasantly surprised. I was also one of the few people to come away from 2049 at all. No one's going to see Blade Runner 2. There are three big reasons for this in my estimation. One, it's a dystopia movie. Folks are sick and tired of dystopia movies. It could be a great dystopia movie, but it's still another dystopia movie. Not very many people seem willing to head out to the theater to watch their miserable, wretched future played out on the big screen anymore. Two, it's a sequel. Folks are getting sick and tired of sequels. It could be a great sequel, which it's not, but it's still another sequel. And a completely unnecessary one at that. Sequel fatigue must be at an all-time high by this point, and I think that's only going to rise. Three, the advertising made it look like shit, mostly because Harrison Ford was featured so prominently in it. I love you, Ford, but you absolutely don't look like you belong in this flick, with your sad puppy dog experience expression, gray t-shirt, and old man boobs. Forcing Ford into this so hard just screamed soulless cash grab to anyone half paying attention. But people see soulless cash grabs all the time, so I really believe it was the added combo of forced sequel and umpteenth dystopia movie that left Blade Runner 2 dead in the water. Oh, and four, I suppose. No one went to see the original Blade Runner. Hollywood overestimated Blade Runner's draw power. I really wish that this hadn't been a Blade Runner movie. If it had just been Kay, Joy, some other twisty plot in the cyberpunk setting, this could have been one of my favorite movies ever. Hell, if it had been Blade Runner 2 without forcing Deckard and Rachel into it, this would probably be way up there for me. As it stands though, 2049 works better as Drive 2 than it does Blade Runner 2. But for all the shit I've just given 2049, I did enjoy Kay's story while it lasted. He might not be a real human being, but he was still a real hero. Real.